Welcome to the New Thinking for a New World podcast, where we explore the most pressing issues that are challenging and changing our societies. We are looking for new thinking and new solutions, wherever we can find them. Listen as host Alan Stoga, the Tolbert Foundation's chairman, challenges his guests for analysis, ideas and actions. Together we can help make our world at least a little bit better. At least for the first half of the 21st century, geopolitics will be defined by the relationship between China and the United States. Confrontation or collaboration, zero-sum game or win-win, war or peace. My guest today is Jonathan Ward, an American who is becoming one of the country's leading China experts. Dr. Ward, who has lived and worked in China and has a deep affinity for the Chinese people, recently published a new provocative book, China's Vision of Victory. Welcome, Jonathan. Uh, Thank you, Alan. It's great to be here. You write in the book, the Chinese vision of victory is about a world in which China's power is limited not by any other state or superpower, but only by the Chinese Communist Party's imagination. So let's start there. What kind of world do you think the CCP imagines? Well, the CCP overall envisions a world in which it's returned, in a sense, to supremacy. I mean, this is built on an ideological um, sense of time and history and a sense of uh, ultimately national destiny. Um, They have a concept called the century of humiliation, which was from the Opium Wars until the founding of the People's Republic in 1949. And this was a period in which they saw themselves as humiliated at the hands of foreign empires. And the, the project of the Communist Party of China, and broadly speaking, the Chinese Revolution, even before the CCP, in the PRC, was to restore China's um, position in the world to one in which they could contend with other major empires, other major powers. But I think they've taken that further now and see it ultimately as um, you know, supremacy in an international system, a system that returns to a sense um, you know, of an earlier um, imperial worldview where China sat at the head of the known world. Um, in what was then East Asia. So um, in today's global world, of course, that would mean China at the top of an international system that is fully global, and their power has expanded worldwide, um, chiefly through economics and um, international influence, but they're also building a military that's designed to secure their expanding power, um, you know, initially in their region, but ultimately around uh, significant places in the globe. There is a sense around almost everywhere that China's rise continued rise is inevitable. Some would even argue good, but leave the good, the value judgment aside for a minute. Uh, And that the rest of the world ought to accommodate that rise. And this is what I would call the place at the table argument, that we have an existing system that China over the last 50 years has emerged as a incipient superpower, maybe a superpower, and that they both deserve and want a place at the table. My sense of your argument is that they don't want a place at the table, they want the table, or rather they want it to be the Chinese table. Is that a fair summary of what you, in fact, just introduced? Well, I think that's right. It's a sense that they are meant to be the dominant power and that the world is sort of uh, essentially set right when, when China has no true rival or equal. And you think about where they are today with the one country that stands in the way as they achieving this kind of um, vision, and that's the United States. So in the same way that the Sino-Soviet split um, happened in the in the Cold War, because essentially Mao could not accept the role of junior partner to the USSR. I mean, today, um, they've never really sat well with other major powers, and they, they see themselves as in the final stretch to uh, surpass the United States and to ultimately usher in a world in which um, they are unchallenged. And that's the world they'd like to be in. So their world is one in which, as you've just said, they're unchallenged. But what does their world look like? beyond the fact that they are the the sole superpower, as the United States was briefly after the fall of the Berlin Wall? I think it has chiefly to do with um, becoming, as they see it, the centerpiece of the global economy. I mean, that's sort of the underlying strategy here is to to become the the dominant feature of a a globalized economy in the center of supply chains, an enormous market that basically brings um, all manner of nations and industries to their door, um, to, to be second to none in terms of technology, military power, to secure, as they see it, their overseas interests that um, really are far beyond, um, you know, East Asia and go across what they've uh, been very clear about in the Belt and Road. I mean, there's an intercontinental um, strategic geography that they see as necessary to project power across uh, those continents and regions. And uh, and then you're talking about a a world that in many ways is... um, 
you know, conceived in the image of the Communist Party, in which there isn't really um, dissent. I mean, they they have obviously expanded their their ability to to coerce and and sort of control as they see it their own population. You know, they they've enacted a massive surveillance state. They've, they're carrying out a genocide in Xinjiang, all manner of of repressive uh, techniques and and processes. And they're talking about a long term future, twenty forty nine, the centennial of the founding of the of the People's Republic of China. If you really had a world in which China was the dominant economy, dominant military. Um, you know, maintain sort of uh, coercive relationships with all manner of, of countries, whether in Asia immediately or in democracies worldwide. Um, you know, we, we would exist in a world of systemic repression that, that may be very similar to, to what's uh, taking place inside their own country. I mean, you look at their ability already to coerce um, other nations, whether that's um, you know the Philippines or, or, or Australia. I mean, you know, by way of trade, um, you know, cutting off imports or, or you know, other uh, ways of utilizing their economic power to uh, combat what they see as, as uh, countries that are resisting them. Imagine that in a world where they really and truly are the largest economy, the largest military. Right now, they're absolutely not. They have not yet achieved this. They are not um, stronger or bigger uh, than the United States. So, so this ambition at present exceeds their capacity. And the whole game now is for them to build their capacity so that it matches their ambitions. Let me push back on one of the things you just said. So the Chinese argument would be that internal uh, issues are internal issues, that yes, we want to be the strongest power, the dominant force, the greatest economy, um, but Australia, the United States, Dominican Republic, we don't care how you organize yourself, just don't get in our, our, our way and make sure you pay tribute in the imperial fashion. Is that a fair statement of what they how they would respond if if they were... If there was a third party in this conversation, they'd say, no, 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 Jonathan, you're exaggerating. We don't care how the United States runs its democracy. I think that's just, um, they may make statements like that, but that's just not true. I mean, here's, you know, just um, at the end of last year, Beijing released a list of the 14 sins of Australia, um, essentially saying, you know, here are the ways that we think Australia needs to conduct itself. So um, they do that all the time. I mean, they tell our corporations what they can do and not do. So the idea that they don't want people to interfere in their internal affairs, and they're quite clear about that's one of their catchphrases, really. And yet at the same time, they absolutely want to shape the way that our CEOs talk and think. They want to shape the way that, um, you know, we look at them and and certainly um, other nations that they are able to coerce. So, I mean, Australia is actually a very good example of of what it's like for China to uh, roll out uh, what it sees as the, the rules of the road for another country. Let's segue to a particular case because it is relevant at the moment. There's been a lot of noise in Asia, in the United States, over Taiwan in recent days and weeks, in numerous incursions of Chinese planes over near Taiwan, deployment of Chinese naval assets. Uh, demonstrating they can, in their words, surround Taiwan, and a lot of a lot of pressure diplomatically, politically. Um, the Chinese have demonstrated strategic patience when it came to Taiwan. From Mao on, they've said, "We know how this story ends. We don't actually care when it ends, just so everyone understands that Taiwan will, in fact, be and is part of China." Is there something going on? Do you think that is this business as usual? or something more serious underway? So the increasing um, tempo of, of sort of uh, incursions into Taiwanese airspace and sort of, um, you know, maritime activities and all of this in the Taiwan Straits and South China Sea, I think is uh, certainly showing, um, it's it's the CCP showing the world that they are prepared to do what they'd like to do in the in the West Pacific and in the, the, the near seas. Um, but the Taiwan issue is, is, you know, certainly one of the core aims for the Communist Party to eventually um, as they see it, reunify um, Taiwan with the mainland. And part of that has a lot to do with the, the broader military geography of the Pacific. I mean, what they'd like to attain by having a kind of unsinkable aircraft carrier um, right there. It gives them open access to the Pacific and um, even more importantly to the Indian Ocean where, you know, so much of their oil and energy and, and um, you know, major trade routes uh, come through that region. So it positions them for the broader intercontinental geography that they seek to um, you know, hold sway over, which is which is that of the Belt and Road, and and at the same time, it's a an ideological goal that's existed for uh, so long since the since the Chinese Civil War, really. So I think um, what we're seeing at the moment 
is um, you know part of a, a, a broader feature of, of China's diplomacy, where they are saying to the United States that we um, you know we're we're ready for this rivalry. I mean, essentially the gloves have have come off. But um, you know, could they could they act on it? I think everybody is is uh, very concerned about that, and and certainly um, you know I think it's it's a primary focus for the U.S. military as it should be, and the need to deter China in um, the West Pacific is going to be one of the core missions of the DOD. So, so yeah, I think we have to be absolutely ready for this and, and taking it very seriously. But why do you think they've turned up the volume now? We've, we've seen increased noise and activity in, in Hong Kong. Uh, we've seen them much more aggressively respond to any criticism. You already mentioned the Australians, uh, but there's a dozen other cases where they have in, in recent weeks, uh, reacted very harshly against any criticism. And now the Taiwan thing, well, it feels like the whole tempo of, of aggressiveness is, is intensifying, is increasing. Well, I think the short answer is because they can. Um, you know, this isn't a short-term sort of current affairs thing. This is, uh, this is part of a, a long-term, um, you know, vision and series of strategies that, um, you know, at the end of which they see themselves as dominating not only the the Indo-Pacific, but ultimately, um, you know, being the unrivaled uh, nation in the world. So here in the 2020s, we've, we've reached, um, you know, there was a concept um, in, in Chinese strategic thinking called the period of strategic opportunity, which was meant to go from about the year 2000 to about 2020. And this was a period in which they believed that the world would sort of accept China's rise, you know, that their integration into the global economy, um, you know, peace in general would um, contribute to their economic development and ultimately to their overall, as they call it, comprehensive national power. Um, and then I think that changed a little bit when the U.S. started to catch on to China as a truly dangerous um, adversary and competitor. So um, at this point, I think on one hand, they believe their own narrative that they are in um, sort of inevitable ascendancy, and that the U.S. and the West more broadly are in terminal decline. And I guess in, in, in their view, those two sort of lines on the graph are, are now converging, and they see themselves as, as a power that, um, you know, can take on uh, the U.S. and, and other, um, you know, countries in the region. And, and they also, uh, you know, I think at this point realize that they um, may have some kind of window op of opportunity in which to to uh, you know, act on some of their long-standing goals, but this is why it's going to be so important to focus on deterrence right now and to be um, incredibly focused on um, getting through this incredibly difficult um, period. And I'm going to read you a passage from the China Daily. So this is even just a few years ago in 2017, um, and and you can see how this fits. You know, the question you're asking about Taiwan, it's not even mentioned here, but this is um, that broader sort of. CCP long-term worldview. They say excellence of weaponry is no longer a big issue for the PLA. Thanks to decades of strenuous efforts and supported by the robust Chinese economy, the Chinese defense industry has cleared the technological bottleneck and the arms embargo of the West to produce some of the most advanced weapons in the world. No one can deny that China's rise has been peaceful, and China has reason to maintain and even extend the period of strategic opportunity well beyond 2020 as it aims to realize the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation by 2049, when the People's Republic of China celebrates its centenary. If China can rise smoothly to the top of the world without firing a single bullet, it will certainly be able to claim the moral high ground. This may sound harsh, but the truth is that peace is not a godsend. It often has to be earned, sometimes at the cost of war. So this is a country that we have to remember. The Communist Party killed 50 million of its own people, in the 20th century, they, um, you know, went to war with the United States and the Korean Peninsula. They fought border skirmishes, um, you know, limited wars with, with India, with Vietnam, with the Soviet Union, which was far more powerful than they were. And there were multiple Taiwan Straits crises. So the military buildup that they've been carrying out for the past, you know, two decades at least in, in a way that truly counts and has changed the balance of power in the Indo-Pacific is also on top of um, a, a party you know, political party that is responsible for, for enormous, um, you know, essentially mass, uh, mass death um, in the past century. So, you know, we should, uh, I think, be quite concerned about um, what their goals are and the possible use of force by China, um, certainly in the years ahead. A world under stress needs leaders in every discipline and in every country. Leaders whose work is innovative, courageous, 
rooted in universal values and global in approach or implication. If you know someone like that, in your company, in your university, in your community, anywhere, please nominate that person for the Talberg SNF Aliasim Global Leadership Prize. Go to talbergprize.org. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G prize.org. On the other hand, the Chinese, in their very long history that they remind everyone of, have never projected power well beyond their borders. Uh, it has been a land empire constantly, constantly in conflict with its border nations, uh, border states over a long period of time. Uh, and now, as you've described, uh, it, it has go- global pretense. Belt and Road is an economic strategy worldwide. Um, do you think China is really capable at this time of a global strategy, or are they, are they like many empires, in danger of overreach? Well, I think let's start with the first statement about China never projecting power. I mean, let's look at the borders of China, because you're talking essentially about um, you know, a series of, of formerly independent states. So, so I think if, if, we, if we actually talk about the, the evolution of China's borders as they are today, um, you're talking about the genocide of a million uh, Junger Mongols in the, in the 1700s under the Kangxi Emperor. You're talking about the constant sort of interplay of, of, of Tibet and China, um, you know, in terms of the, the uh, subjugation of Tibet. You're talking about, um, you know, going into Vietnam here and there. But broadly, it, it is a country that never projected power in the way that imperial uh, sort of Western European countries did. But the, the borders of China are imperial borders. And as, as one, I believe it was Peter Perdue pointed out, the ironies of modern China today are that they want their imperial borders, but they do not want to be thought of as an empire. So, um, so I don't think that we owe them that courtesy of uh, saying that they've never used force. Now, that's different from being able to uh, underpin a global strategy and something that is truly global. And I think that's why, you know, for present, you know, consideration of what China's uh, long-term strategy is, I mean, this is why economics is at the center. I mean, for, for China to surpass the United States in the past decade as the, the top um, trading nation is, is a very significant milestone. I mean, to be the, the top trading partner for, um, you know, a plurality of the world's nations, I mean, to, to be the second largest economy with economic interests all over the planet, uh, to drive the global commodity cycle. I mean, these are the instruments of, uh, this is sort of their global, um, you know, heft, as it were, now. Whereas their military power is going to be concentrated around, um, on one hand, as they say, the ceaseless expansion of their overseas interests. So yes, you're talking about the beginning of them being able to go go abroad. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really built for combat with the U.S. and our allies in the West Pacific, um, potentially for uh, action against India in the Himalayas or even in the Indian Ocean, though that would be a, a bigger reach at this point. Um, so I think you're talking about the evolution of an imperial power um, in the 21st century that's built on economics first and then a military that's designed to follow uh, their trading interests. So, uh, but you're, you're right, Alan, to point out that that's, uh, that's quite a you know, a, a heavy lift to actually get there. And it doesn't mean they're going to do this. I mean, it doesn't mean that they will succeed. And, and I think it's very important for the world come together to ensure that the plans of the Communist Party of China uh, do not ultimately prevail. That's a problem because it's quite clear that the European view of China overlaps, but is somewhat different from the American view of China, uh, which overlaps, but is somewhat different from perhaps the Japanese view of, of China. Do you see a path towards a coming together of an understanding, a common and shared understanding of what's at risk here? Well, I think there's certainly a, past, a path to, to doing that, and I think it's starting to take shape uh, little by little. Um, you know, the three recommendations I put out in China's vision of victory to, you know, ultimately uh, counter this, this vision of the party and its, you know, broader goals were the United States will have to remain the world's top economy. You'll have to unite the world's democracies um, in a diplomacy that, that can counter China um, at every turn as needed. And then you have to maintain def- uh, defense and deterrence in the Pacific. So, you know, I, I think that we're seeing um, at least a couple of those things start to, to move forward a little bit. And um, as to Europeans, um, you know, Europe's view of China, I mean, this is certainly, I think, um, the question on which the free world's diplomacy turns. I mean, we have to be united with Europe in a sense of what China's really about. Um, you know, I think Britain has started to 
see the differences here. I mean, their latest um, defense review is has given sort of a new importance to to the Pacific. The uh, events that you've mentioned, I think, have had an effect. For example, um, you know, consolidating control over Hong Kong. I mean, that certainly uh, rattled, I think, uh, many in in Europe and certainly in Britain. Um, you know, the sanctioning of of uh, European MEPs, um, you know, just in the wake of the of the investment deal, um, you know, getting on the table. I mean, that that's going to have a counter. Um, they'll they'll be blowback to that, no doubt. And I think you're starting to see, you know, differences in the parliaments. I mean, in the in the Bundestag, you've got uh, certainly um, a, another generation of parliamentarians that uh, do care about the human rights issues and do care about the genocide taking shape in Xinjiang. And ultimately, you know, for for Europe to understand. China through the lens of security and human rights is going to be essential. And we're going to have to be building our economic relations among our fellow democracies in an alliance-based trading system. And that's what we really need worldwide to integrate Asia, Europe, North America into um, uh, an alliance-based trading system so that our economies can prosper, even if, as we have to take um, harsher measures against China on human rights grounds and security grounds and otherwise. That is an excellent point, because you make the point in your book, and you've made the point again today, that China has a multifaceted strategy, which is at the core based on economics. And if we were having this conversation two or three years ago, there would have been a question as to whether or not we could decouple not just the United States economy and the Chinese economy, but the Western economies from the Chinese economy. Clearly perhaps not intended. One unintended consequence of the Trump administration is we've discovered you can indeed decouple. Another consequence of the pandemic perhaps has been you can decouple. But clearly that is at enormous cost. We're in a period where the friction is rising. You can, you can sort of smell the, 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 the friction starting to burn a little bit. But are we at the point of a break? And if so, how do we manage that break? Well, yes. I mean, I do think that that at this point, you know, if you're a business leader and and you see China as one of the essential elements of of your long term strategy, i.e., where you're going to be in the next ten years, I, I don't think that um, is going to work out very well. I mean, the geopolitics are going to overtake um, that strategy, and and China just can't be uh, what you're basing your your future investment or, or or you know market goals on. I mean, you have to have a new uh, global strategy. And we're going to have to find offsets. I mean, um, you know, it's going to be, I think, about uh, repositioning worldwide so that we can reduce dependency on China. And certainly events like you've mentioned, like the pandemic, um, have accelerated the thinking on how to do that. I mean, there was a Congressional Research Service report on um, medical supply chains linked to China that was absolutely fantastic. I and mean, this is a very detailed um, assessment of how we're dependent on China for uh, medical supplies and how to uh, fix that dependency. And you could start to apply that to a whole range of strategic industries. Um, and I think that's why a new American industrial policy is going to be essential. I mean, coordinating industrial policy with um, other free countries in, in, you know, in Europe, in Asia, uh, in India. I mean, you're going to have to rebuild a, a new form of globalization uh, that is built on the world's democracies and builds a way from the autocracies, from Russia, China, and, and Iran. And uh, this happens every few generations, and we're going to have to prepare for it by, um, you know, looking to find growth among the other democracies. And, and the other thing is, I think we have to understand there's a natural decoupling that's going to happen, because the other major economic update that's going to happen in this decade is, um, you know, the Internet of Things and the digitization of, of all kinds of uh, machinery and, and processes and, um, you know, consumer appliances and you name it. And, and at the end of the day, our two operating systems just won't be compatible. I and mean, we're not going to be using um, uh, Alibaba sort of smart refrigerators or Huawei smart cars anymore. Um, you've seen the Communist Party has already called Tesla into question when it comes to uh, their, their fear of, of American um, technology. So, so you're going to have the tech decoupling that I think is, is, is more than just uh, technology. I mean, it's going to affect multiple industries. And and with that, you wind up in a bifurcated world. So it's better for us to be investing now in what that bifurcation looks like. We're going to have to rebuild our ability to do, to do manufacturing in uh, North America and in Europe and other democracies as well. And, and ultimately to, to uh, pave the way for a new divergence from China, where we can ultimately leave them behind economically, defund 
their uh, military capabilities and um, essentially prevent their, their ambitions from coming to fruition. That's a dramatically different world than the one that we thought we were living in. Um, certainly over the last 30, 40 years, this move towards a globalized world, famously Tom Friedman's The World's Flat, we're all um, going to share the same operating systems. We're all going to share the same resources. The inevitable leveling of cultural differences, of et cetera, et cetera. That's a naive version of, of what we have been living through. But indeed, we have built an entire global infrastructure, everything from the United Nations through the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Uh, indeed, how banking works today. Everything is structured, assuming that we would have this well-integrated, stable, sustainable world. Um, and you've just said it's time to rethink that world. Well, I think that, you know, on, on one hand, many of the institutions you've you've mentioned are certainly, you know, predate the sort of Thomas Friedmanism and all of that um, and, and you know, serve their very important roles in a, in a post-Second World War order and in the sort of so-called Pax Americana. But, you know, I remember when... Um, my my great uncle, who was uh, involved with the OSS, um, gave me a copy of Thomas Friedman's The World is Flat when I was on my way after graduating from Columbia, where I did Russian and Chinese. I took the Trans-Siberian Railway from Moscow to Beijing, and he gave me this book, and he said, look, you know, I don't understand this anymore. And a very experienced man, but he said, I don't, you read this book, and you tell me what you think. And I read Thomas Friedman, The World is Flat, you know, on my way uh, on the, the eight-day train ride across Siberia. And about halfway into it, I just thought, this just can't be true. This doesn't make any sense. This, you know, I've already observed things on this train that don't track with this. I mean, the world is so much more complex than something that just fits together in, in terms of sort of a, a shared, you know, as though economics is going to uh, override every human complexity. And then as I started to really dedicate myself to the study of languages and history, um, you know, I, I thought what H.R. McMaster says frequently about this, about strategic narcissism, the idea that we, um, you know, attribute to, to other uh, nations or adversaries our own thinking. So it's almost as though when Americans put themselves in the shoes of Beijing, we put ourselves in the shoes of Beijing. We don't think, we don't know how Beijing looks at the world. So I, I embarked on this very long-term study of, of a variety of different regions and languages. And uh, it, it was very clear to me. I mean, you know, several months after reading The World is Flat, I myself was in Xinjiang, you know, and Tibet hitchhiking with, with truck drivers and hiding from the Chinese army in these regions that we all know about today. And that in many ways are the, the, the source and the essence of the incompatibility of these systems. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, a genocide in a region that the Communist Party calls the core area of the Belt and Road, which is their intercontinental vision, is simply not compatible with the values and institutions of the free and democratic world. And I think it's better off that we accept that and begin to rebuild um, in a way that can ultimately um, prevent, you know, the worst possibilities of that vision or of the clash of these systems. I mean, we're going to have to re sort of... Uh, reinvigorate our own institutions and societies and prepare um, for a very long game. But it is one that we can win. And I, I really do uh, believe that. And we have to focus um, on economics, diplomacy, and defense. And if you get those three things right, and you sustain that over a long-term period, I think we will come out of this just fine. There's an argument that we aren't very, we the United States, we the West, aren't very good at strategy. Uh, that we're very good at managing in a crisis. Uh, we're very good at reacting to a situation and adjusting, but we're not very good at thinking of where we'd like to be in 2049 to pick a date. Uh, the Chinese clearly are extremely good at, at that kind of thinking. It's what they do. Uh, is it a fair competition? Well, I spent 10 years ab abroad before coming back to the United States to to start my my company and, and do my work on on these subjects and you know so so the country in a way that I'm learning most about now is my own country America and I just do think that there is this endless sort of uh, source of renewal in this country I mean we do meet every challenge that is what we do it's our entire history and um, you know as I look back as a historian you know I have my doctorates in history essentially and um, as I look back at American, you know, the history of American foreign policy, I think there are incredible examples of strategic thinking. I think, you know, the entire long-term strategy of containment was one of the most 
successful grand, grand strategies in, in history. And it was sustained and executed over a 45 year period, essentially, um, passed from one administration to the next, you know, innovated on, you know, sort of adjusted, updated, and, and ultimately it led to, in, in the shadow of, of nuclear terror, it led to the peaceful conclusion of the Cold War with a global adversary that, that absolutely did seek world preeminence. And I, I just think there's, there's an incredible, you know, genius to America. It's just, there's nothing like it in the world. And once we apply ourselves to this problem, and once we're able to bring our allies and friends uh, to this situation, I think it'll activate the best of our values and bring together the deepest reservoirs of our potential. And we think we can't forget, this is a country that's made up of everybody. I mean, that was the part that I found so exciting about spending all my years abroad as an American was whether I was in the Middle East or, or China or India or Latin America. I mean, everybody would, you know, tell me how they wanted to come to the United States and be a part of our future and our country. And, and I think that was a somewhat unique experience for an American millennial to see that the world, uh, many, many people of the world uh, did think that our success counted and they saw themselves as part of it. So I, I just think that our opportunity to lead um, through this moment uh, is is extraordinary, and, and and if we are able to maintain peace throughout this competition, um, focus on the real decisive turning points and the real sort of uh, nature of the contest, um, I, I think it'll make us stronger, and uh, and it may even resolve some of the, the deep troubles that we are now experiencing at home. So so I am optimistic about um, not only the United States but the uh, the future of the free world. And, and all the great nations that are in it, from India to Japan to Australia to across Europe to, you know, many other nations, and certainly the rising, um, you know, nations in the emerging world, which all in the past century threw off various forms of imperialism and do not want to see that again. I mean, many of them understand what it would be like to be dominated by the People's Republic of China. And I think that presents an opportunity for an enormous counterpoint from the United States to lead in the emerging world, perhaps in ways that we have never done before. I mean, that was envisioned by Kennedy. He, he had a fascination with Asia and Africa and the independence movements and, and saw that America could play an important role in that. But today we're going to have to do that through economics. Uh, let me ask a last, probably unfair question. We live in a world where there is, um, there's a lot of surprises. You actually have to wake up every day and, and see what happened because things are happening that are out of the normal range of expectations. What would most surprise you? Wake up tomorrow, a week from tomorrow, what headline would most surprise you? It's a great question. There are a lot of headlines that wouldn't surprise me that, you know, when, when Xi Jinping made himself ruler for life, that wasn't a surprise. You know, the things in Hong Kong weren't a surprise. The clashes on the Indian border weren't a surprise. You know, even action on Taiwan, it's in the cards. I mean, we all need to understand that that's a possibility. Um, what would really and truly surprise me? I just love, I'd love to see uh, bipartisanship in America. I'd love to see us heal our own differences and um, take an approach to the world that recognizes, that recognizes our essential role and, and that you know, if, if we started to lay down our arms against each other, so to speak, I mean, that, that would probably be the, uh, the thing that surprises me, but the most pleasant surprise. It would be a pleasant surprise. Unfortunately, that we both agree it would be a surprise probably tells us that it's not the most likely thing that we'll read, but, but who knows. Jonathan, thank you very much for this. We clearly are at an inflection point, probably a series of inflection points, and it is about thinking differently and not projecting uh, what happened yesterday to what's likely to happen tomorrow, and that's the work you're doing. Thank you for bringing that perspective. Thank you, Alan. It's been great to be here. Thank you for listening. Now it's your turn. Tell us what you think. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, or you can subscribe to our newsletter at talbergprize.org. Thanks again, and most importantly, don't forget to nominate a leader whose work deserves to be recognised and imitated. This podcast brought to you through the generous support of SNF, the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation.